okay, folks, this is going to be a biggie. We are here with the experts, and we're going to have great conversation about CAL FIRE's aviation program. So good that we're going to break this into two separate episodes, all right? So this first episode, we're going to have great conversation about where we are right now with CAL FIRE's aviation program. We're going to talk about all the technical advancements, what the future looks like, how this program is currently taking care of California's public today. We're able to deploy more now because we have more assets to deploy it with. We you know, you go back 10 years, we didn't have the, as many large air tankers or the number of air tankers that we have in the fleet today. Then we're going to do a bonus episode again with those same experts to have a deep dive into the history of CAL FIRE's aviation program, give you all of the background and how we got to become the world renowned aviation program that we are today. Hang in there, folks. This is going to be a good time. Let's get cooking. All right, folks, so here we are yet again with another Five Points Podcast with the Chief. I am here with the Chief, Chief Tyler. Good day to you, sir. How are we doing? Good morning. It's a good day. Absolutely, absolutely. And for the first time, folks, we have yet another guest uh, with us. We have Assistant Deputy Director Jake Sholand, the Assistant Deputy Director of Fire Protection Operations uh, in charge of mobile equipment and aviation. Good to see you, sir. How's everything going for you today? I'm doing great, Monty. Good morning. It's good, good, good. To be good. Here. We are so happy to have you here. This is going to be a great podcast. Uh, like I said, it'll be the first with uh, a, an additional guest. And so I think we're going to have a really good time talking about an amazing program uh, that Cal Fire has with us, our aviation program. But before we do that, uh, Chief Sholin, I would love for you to just kind of quickly walk through your background and kind of how you came up through the department and what led you to being uh, the Assistant Deputy Director over uh, Wings and Wheels today. Wow, okay. Uh, I started in uh, 1997 as a seasonal firefighter in the Nevada Eba Plaster Unit. Nice. Uh, just typical um, that you see in, in folks in our career in terms of being a seasonal firefighter working up through the ranks in the unit. Uh, several units in the northern region. Um, ultimately, where it got me here, though, was was working as the battalion chief at the Grass Valley Air Attack Base for six years uh, in the aviation program. Um, great mentorship, you know, for my leaders then, and, and basically they stuck me on the course of aviation, and I haven't got off that track since. Uh, nice. <laughs> ultimately, coming through um, the tactical air operations program, um, recently as the as the staff chief of, of tactical air operations, and then and several months ago now taking this position. It's, it's interesting. I just noticed you said that you started as a seasonal firefighter, right? Uh, so then to transition from that into aviation, and it just goes to show everybody that there are so many different opportunities uh, within CAL FIRE. You never know where, where, where life's going to take you. And so it's really cool to see someone uh, kind of transition into something like that. That's really, really amazing. So one of the things that we really want to talk about first is getting into the idea of what are some of the CAL FIRE current statistics with the aviation program. So we know that that program is busy. We know that it has to be busy and it does a lot to keep this department running and to keep the people uh, of California safe. So uh, chiefs, if we could just talk a little bit about some of the statistics and things that really uh, highlight how you all do what you do in the aviation program. Let's get into that piece a little bit. Of course, he wants to ask me statistics off the top of my head. <laughs> <laughs> um, I got 22 uh, uh, numbers for you. I haven't, I haven't uh, seen that 23 numbers, but they're going to be very similar off the, off the, off of the last two years, uh, the activity we've had. So last year we, we had about 9 million gallons of retardant deployed across the state on, on, uh, on fires. That's amazing. Roughly 15 million gallons in, in water delivery from, from aircraft, uh, for fixed wing flight hours, you're in the, in the, in the 9,000, um, hour range. I don't, I don't remember what the copters were last year. Yeah. We were in a lot of transition between the two different models. So I don't have the collective number versus what on fires versus what was training. Um, on the air rescue side in the neighborhood of 140 to 150 air rescues is pretty common for us in a year. Um, our busiest year though, just put it in context was 2020 as far as retardant delivery was. And that was, that was upwards of, um, 18 to 19 million gallons were deployed wow. across the state. Wow. Yeah. 
million gallons, folks, million gallons. It's, it's just amazing to hear those numbers and how much work goes into uh, everything that we do. Uh, in 22, you know, was definitely not as big of a year as some of our other years, but definitely we had a lot of activity. And so that alone is insane. And then you talk about 18 million gallons. I, 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 wow. Wow. What an amazing program. I agree. Yeah. Yeah. Well, part of that you got to remember is um, the retardant is we're able to deploy more now because we have more assets to deploy it with. We, you know, you go back 10 years, we didn't have the, as many large air tankers or the number of air tankers that we have in the fleet today. And so one could argue on the large fires we had, like going back to the Cedar fire, if we had enough large aircraft to make that type of delivery of suppressants and, and we didn't. And now today, you know, um, we, we have those private assets, you know, yeah. we can contract and add to our fleet to increase the uh, increased capability, which is nice. Very cool. Very cool. Thanks, Chief. There are 39 million citizens here in the state of California that we serve and protect in one way, shape, or form. Uh, as we're talking about the aviation program here, uh, you know, today, you know, one of the things that is probably really interesting to talk about is how we strategically place uh, our fleet in order to ensure we can quickly respond uh, to situations and get those services to the people as quickly as possible. Um, so let's talk a little bit about how we position our aircraft and how our air bases are positioned and how that came about. Uh, Chiefs, if you wouldn't mind kind of hitting on on some of those pieces. Yeah, absolutely. So, you know, um, our goal in, uh, strategically has been to uh, – try to have air bases, helitech bases located strategically across the state to ensure that we get uh, aircraft anywhere in the state of California in about 20 minutes. Now, that's just with our agency aircraft and our agency helitech bases and air tech bases. But uh, over time, um, and especially in these last couple of years, we've had an augmentation of aircraft that have allowed us to place aircraft in other than our helitech and air tech bases across the state. But specifically back to... Um, Back to our state uh, bases and uh, and our uh, 11th Hell Attack base that we have uh, in San Diego that we talked about earlier. There are uh, 14 uh, air attack bases across the state and uh, 10, uh, 10 bases, some of those being air attack bases as well, that include a Hell Attack base. Uh, and then the 11th, uh, of course, being in San Diego. And um, that is really uh, part of you know, making sure we get the aircraft where they need to be in that amount of time strategically. And we know that the aircraft are there to uh, support the boots on the ground. We will always need the boots on the ground to be able to do that. Uh, but, uh, but getting aircraft over an incident, I'll, I'll take it back to um, a comment that was made by one of the unit chiefs here last year. It said, um, you know, with the augmented aircraft that, you know, it'd been a long time since you'd ever seen, you know, five or more type one helicopters over an incident within the first 15 minutes. And that is really a true value add mm -hmm. uh, to our aviation program. There was a point in the early days where, you know, Victorville, uh, George Air Force Base was staffed with, um, with folks at a San Bernardino that were simply sitting in a vehicle. Uh, likewise, uh, having come from Amador El Dorado, we opened um, a reload base that is now an air tanker base at, uh, at McClellan. And that started with, um, sitting in vehicles to transitioning to a tough shed on a generator, transitioning to where we are today, wow. uh, and being able to make those advancements. Ultimately, we were able to permanently fund uh, McClellan and open that. Uh, and through the C-130 program, we were able to uh, start the process to reopen permanently um, the Fresno Air Attack Base as well. And, you know, there's a lot of history there that I didn't know about as we as – we, uh, move towards this initiative of reopening that air attack base in cooperation with our federal partners. You know, we talk about our, we talk about our uh, state assets, but it's so important as well to recognize uh, our federal partners who strategically place uh, aircraft across the state, and those aircraft are also available as a national asset. Uh, and our local government partners, uh, largely our contract counties uh, in um uh, Kern and Ventura, Santa Barbara, Orange and LA, who uh, also have a fleet of aircraft. And then our other local government partners in San Diego and 
Uh, I think Marin is getting into uh, potentially a program now as well. Uh, Contra Costa with Reach, um, and even up in uh, Calusa County, Chief Gilbert and Williams is working on uh, aircraft being placed at the local government level uh, through cooperative agreements with private partners uh, to add to the fleet of aircraft across the across the uh, state is really going to be a value add yeah. uh, of significance. Um, so again, placing those aircraft strategically across the state are really what make a difference. Do you have anything to add? Oh, that says it all right there. <laughs> <laughs> you covered it. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, I'll leave some. So, I'll leave some words for you. Well, if you want, you want some history. If you go sure. back to the early seventies when we started, we had, we had more bases than we had now under those first contracts. That Placerville was one. Siski Airport oh, yes. was one. Yeah. That is so true. Under the first five contracts, those airplanes were spread out closer together that you don't see now. Interesting. Now that's that's an interesting point. So how did those go away? What happened there? Why, are, why, why was there such a change? That's when you saw us um, starting to go, go towards our own fleet model, but then you also saw the evaluation of the capability and where the threat was in the state in the 70s, and that's where the ultimate placement happened now. And so the 20-minute circle to meet our objective or the 20-minute time frame was based on the 1970s, mid-70s. So now if gotcha. you look at today, you look at how much we've increased the performance, um, range, speed, capability of the aircraft, you know, the original model was 1970, so our aircraft have a lot further reach right, than what right. they originally had. Nice under that 20 minute time frame. Yeah, you might have just explained to me why uh, northbound uh, northbound I five Siskiyou County Weed Airport. There's an old S two that sits off the side of the freeway there. Uh, maybe because it was an original air attack base. Well, I know it was under contract in use because one of them, um, uh, Siskiyou Flying Service, was one of the companies that we actually contracted. But a lot of those S2s that you see out there is just requests by the airport. Oh, so there's, there's several airports that have S2 um, sitting out there. Very models. nice. Interesting. So quick question then. So does that mean that at some point in the future there will be another assessment of where our – uh, bases are and whether or not there needs to be some shifting and changing. Is that something that might happen or, or do things seem to be pretty stagnant for the foreseeable future? If that's a fair question. I will tell you this, that, uh, and kind of get off topic just a little bit, but, uh, the department is really still built around the 1940 Clark plan and, uh, and through, uh, strategic, uh, initiatives and reviews, we've expanded it to where it is today. And uh, one of the commitments of uh, the leadership here at the department leadership level and uh, the region chiefs are working on developing, um, you know, not really, I'm not going to call it a standards of cover, but a, a future plan of what our assets look like and what our assets need to look like into the future. Yeah, interesting. Yeah, that's, that's an interesting point. So, Chief Cholin, earlier you mentioned your experience and background in TAU, or Tactical Air Operations. Wanted to get you and Chief Tyler to briefly talk about uh, how that program is working, what's going on with it. Uh, can you give me a little bit more information about how that all is working? Uh, it was, uh, I could get this wrong, uh, probably Deputy Director Fire Protection Andy McMurray uh, was the one who established um, the Tactical Air Operations Program mm. in 2008. Yeah, that sounds and, about right. Um, mm -hmm. And really, that was uh, a program that he established by moving positions from uh, the staff of Fire Protection Operations here at headquarters. He, he uh, was able to pull a position in designated as Tactical Air Operations. Um, and he really saw and had that vision of the future of aviation management unit really was over the aircraft, uh, the maintenance of it, some of the operations of it. But there was this other component about making sure that uh, we were training our personnel appropriately, making sure that they had the operational background and, quite honestly, uh, some accidents that we had had over the, over the, the years that really uh, uh, showed the need uh, for this program to take light. If it's been an evolution of what started in 2008, really, as a single mm -hmm. uh, employee uh, who is designated in the, pro in the program, not only to do what I talked about, but also wildland fire chemicals, I think, got thrown into that as well. To, um, quite honestly, uh, I probably couldn't even tell you how many employees you currently have uh, under tactical air operations. It's an ever-evolving uh, program, given more and more responsibility year after year. Um, up to and including most recently, you know, 
Jake, I think uh, when you entered tactical air operations, it might have been under the uh, un unmanned uh, aerial platform programs, right. uh, where working with our federal partners, you uh, and staff uh, and, and, and some great staff that you brought in have really taken it to where we are today. Um, but maybe, um, maybe tell us a little bit more about um, what some of the things tactical air operations does. Yeah, tactical air operations uh, beginning in 2008 really was, was um, as chief as you said, a recognition that there's the program so specialized that you had to have people focus onto it. Case in point, you certainly don't want a, a firefighter working on an airplane, you know, <laughs> right? right. <laughs> you probably don't want the same firefighter piloting right. the airplane. So, <laughs> so the work that happens at, at Aviation Management Unit is very key. It's a very specialized yeah, role. There's absolutely. very few that could actually do what they're doing. We got to remember. The, the aircraft that we're flying are not common everyday aircraft. And so um, they just can't walk out on the street and, and find a, a candidate to come in and equal what they have currently. Right. They have to bring a candidate in to develop them into what we need yeah. to work on, on the specialized equipment we have. On the TAU side, um, the, it's just the other side of the house in terms of the firefighter training, the aviation training mm -hmm. for the CAL FIRE personnel at the Hell Attack Base and the Air Attack Base, the operations that occur there. Um, the, the fire chemicals was brought up was a big one. Somebody to oversee that contract um, in terms of how the deployment is, the, right. the coordination between the air assets and the ground, the incident command structure systems. That's where Tau um, uh, does a lot of like uh, liaison work in there. There's the military side of our, our uh, department. So military aviation um, is all liaison through tactile air operations. And then we also have um, the UAS program that was started in 2020, which is um, um, evolved quite a bit. I'm sure we'll probably talk about it some more later, but in essence, that's what tactical air operation is. Um, it's gone from a single employee that first year to about uh, two employees about a year and a half, two years later. Yeah. It held there for, for several years. And then ultimately when I um, was hired at the end of 2019 to go in the TAU, uh, I was the fifth person in there. Uh, we quickly went to sixth. Uh, me and my partner um, uh, came in at about the same time. So there's six of us. It's growing. In January of yeah. 2020. And then uh, to date, we're at 12 total. So we've doubled our force. That's amazing. Yeah. That's amazing. The need is there 100%. So Chiefs Tyler and uh, Sholin, what do you see for the future uh, of the aviation program? Kind of wh where are we headed with all of this? I mean, we're doing such a great job now. We've got so many different elements that are working really well for us. Wh where do we see all of this going? Well, it's going to go a lot of places, we're, we're hoping, but uh, one of the main focuses we're on right now is evolving our, our training program, you know, because as we talk about uh, new aircraft coming into the into the fleet, such as the S-70I or the expansion of our of our, um, of our our fleet, the, the, the uh, diversity of it with the C-130 program, we got to look at, you know, the air crews that are going to fly those aircraft, yeah. right? And so... Um, in the past, you know, a lot of um, a lot of training was done um, in the actual aircraft themselves. And so when you're looking at, um, you know, from an economic standpoint of, of putting flight hours on and spending money to do training that could possibly be done on the ground through like simulator based training. Or if you're looking at it from a risk perspective of not, you know, not having to fly anymore than the necessary or um, when weather conditions don't allow you to actually use the aircraft. Um, there's a lot of number. The maintenance on the aircraft would be another one. Right. Um, We've, we've evolved into identifying a location for a Cal Fire Aviation Training Center right. and and um, made arrangements and uh, have actually um, purchased and are uh, in use of several simulators. Uh, one is for the S-70I program, the, the nice. new, new Cal Fire Hawk, uh, which has been a big help, um, uh, including a, uh, a hoist simulator so we can practice those hoists on the ground um, and not have to be in the air doing them right, live. Right. Um, we've got the S2 simulator. We've got an OV-10, our tactical aircraft uh, simulator, and also the, the C-130. They're all established in place. Um, the C-130 is just now getting finalized on some of the software, but this next training cycle is going to bring uh, all those to bear uh, in our training model. So roughly we're doing about 1,200 people annually is how many uh, in the department are getting trained in an aviation realm, whether it's the air crew or, or the support yeah. positions. Yeah. Um, so just bringing that training into a centralized location and, uh, and having the, the increased staff at both um, AMU and Tau has helped us uh, perform more of our, more of our role in producing pilots and air crews. Whereas in the past we were very heavily reliant on the units providing personnel uh, to come into the program and do a lot of those functions, whether it was a development and or training. So that's, that's where we're at now. Yeah. Um, the uh, UAS has been another involvement of the program. Uh, we started in 2020 mentioned earlier 
we're in the neighborhood of 130 pilots um, statewide right now. Um, those numbers are going up, of course, with the classes that we have over the fall. And, and then we're running about the same amount of UAS right now, um, which are deemed an aircraft. And the reason they come in the tactical air operations, most yeah. people don't know, is the UAS is defined by the FAA as an aircraft. Right, and therefore, right. it goes into the aviation world. Um, but a very important program. It's been a very difficult program to to evolve just based on the new emerging technology and the capability and whatnot. And then, um, but we've done very well with that Um throughout the state where we're doing all risk missions with them now um, to, to varying degrees of obviously fire, wildland fire is a big portion of it where right. a lot of point to point detection, fire mapping, uh, situational awareness to fire ground leaders. Yeah. That's kind of the heavy hitters for that program. Um, at the same time though, we're doing the all risk mission where we're actually expanding into payload delivery uh, for um, uh, water rescue devices are being used on the coast uh, as we speak. Yeah. Um, you know, we're working in the snow environment on uh, in, in those type of avalanche conditions and whatnot. So, that's kind of the new things going on right now. Yeah, it's amazing. That's that's big stuff. It's it's you know you don't even think when you talk about that unmanned, uh, the UAS stuff. It's like, I don't know. It, from from someone who's not a part of the program, it's just so cool to hear how technology really has come in to play. And I know it it happens in a number of different facets uh, of of the department and our operations. But to hear UAS and how. Uh, critical it's becoming as a part of the program it's just that's amazing man the future is it, it, we we don't know what we're going to see man that's just really cool yeah what yeah. most people probably don't know it's not just fire protection we have um, every program in the department whether it's resource management state fire marshal's office right. uh, our technical service uh, program they're they're all participating in that program using that uas tool um, yeah. for their needs which that that's the cool part about it yeah very nice you know talking about those simulators uh I think it'll roll into, uh, you know, another part of the future we've talked a little bit about already. But I, uh, I went with then Director uh, Fire, uh, Chief Porter uh, to Orlando, Florida, to a National Association of State Foresters meeting uh, pre-pandemic. And uh, while I was there, I, I figured out that some of our aviation management unit staff and many of our then dying now momentum pilots were just down the road in Clearwater, Florida at a uh, facility that has a lifelike simulator uh, for C-130s. And I don't know if we send people there still or not based on our advancements, but, um, but uh, it was really an opportunity for me to, uh, well, uh, I will say that I cheated out of the NASF <laughs> meeting and <laughs> drove to Clearwater, Florida and spent the day, uh, watching our pilots and, and flight engineers, flight crews go through uh, real-life uh, C-130 simulations. And uh, I remember uh, the staff there, Brad Baker, uh, you know, putting me in the pilot seat. And, of course, I was not successful. Right, at, right, right. Uh, I was successful at taking <laughs> off, but I just wasn't successful at landing. <laughs> Good so, thing it was a simulator. <laughs> so I never claim uh, to be an aviator. Yeah. But uh, good times. Uh, but... You know, the other advancement really uh, diving into that is the C-130 program. I talked about a little bit uh, already a little earlier, but uh, that program transitioned from uh, the Forest Service to us. So a little bit about that. Um, then uh, Chief, uh, I think it was a transition from Chief Payne to Chief Brown uh, and Stu Sprung uh, had this uh, stellar idea of going into this uh aviation program with C-130s to acquire seven C-130s from, uh, from the military uh, and converting those into, uh, into air tankers. And so they provide a presentation to uh, then-director Pimlott and Berenson and, uh, and myself and really showing the value of um, the C-130 program. We knew Colson was already flying C-130s, mm -hmm. but uh, when we look at our capacity and payload of the S-2 uh, compared to the capacity and payload of uh, C-130 uh, H model uh, and the videos they were showing us to try to get us to buy <laughs> into this program uh, was, uh, was clearly remarkable yeah. on the payload that a uh, S-2 compared to a C-130 would, uh, would drop. And uh, nearly four times the amount, I guess, depending on your elevation, you know, what do you call it, high, high and heavy? Hot and um, heavy, yeah. So... Uh, so really, that set us off on a course of um, of entering into the C-130 program. At the at, at the goal, uh, we 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 have today seven C-130s that are sitting at McClellan uh, that are uh, had the inner and outer wing boxes replaced, um, had 
uh, them painted and we're re- waiting on the retardant delivery systems to be installed as well. So what's the history behind it? The history is uh, really uh, it's a U.S. Coast Guard aircraft through the National Defense Authorization Act of 2019 was to have the United States Air Force retrofit uh, these aircraft into air tankers, and then once completed and airworthy, they would transfer title to uh, the state of California. And, uh, of course, uh, we run into uh, the pandemic, uh, run into supply chain issues, uh, run into contracting issues, have had great partnerships with uh, all of our federal military partners uh, to get us where we are thus far. Um, but we have to get it across the finish line. So uh, the intent of uh, our C-130 program going into the future is uh, really to uh, take five of the seven of those C-130s uh, and put them into operational capacity with the last two being f- as, as reserves and spares uh, to account for maintenance. Mm-hmm. And, um, and at the end of the day, those five C-130s will uh, be placed in, uh, in Chico, McClellan, Paso Robles, uh, Fresno and Ramona. Now, as part of that, um, once we put those five aircraft into place, we are going to likely pull uh, a S2 out of Paso and the S2 out of Chico. And why are we going to do that? Uh, we recognize that of our 23 S2Ts, that there are really limited airframes that are out there that are available to replace them in the event that we ever have an unfortunate accident uh, again, so much like our UH-1H helicopters where AMU would pull them in, do a full IRAN or a full teardown and rebuild right, on all of right. them, uh, we're going to do the same thing with uh, those two extra reserve uh, S2Ts. Right now, we only have one extra Tanker 100 uh, as an extra S2, mm-hmm. and uh, this will increase that uh, reserve capacity. At the same time, we're hoping we'll extend the life cycle of a S2T by 20 to 30 years, hopefully, yeah. uh, being able to move forward. So uh, we got ourselves in that great partnership of, um, of, of seeing where we're at to date. We've also significantly expanded uh, the aviation management unit through a new hangar capable of, I think, holding four C-130s at any one time. Uh, they've moved their fixed wing program over into that hangar as well at AMU. Uh, and then sitting just off to the edge of it is the McClellan Air Tanker Base, so co-located, uh, great partnerships that are going yeah. on there. But, um, you know, as we go into the future, we recognize that we got to get this program across the finish line. So where are we at today and why are they not flying yet? So where we're at today is... Uh, the fiscal year 2024 National Defense Authorization Act, uh, working with uh, our congressionals and the administration, uh, we decided to uh, to take this program across the finish line uh, and uh, make it operational uh, ourselves. And um, and so with that, that National Defense Authorization Act has language in it that will transfer all seven of the C-130s in an as-is condition with the great work of the Coast Guard and the Air Force having done all the maintenance and the paint and all the work thus far uh, and transfer the title without the retardant uh, systems in them. Mm -hmm. And then we will finish that. And our hope is, uh, our hope is that uh, we will at least see the first C-130 even, even do a test drop in 2024 is my hope uh, to be able to move it forward. And, um, you know, I think it's going to, um, continue to, to evolve and revolutionize uh, our programs into the future. There, you know, some early concerns were about uh, the wing boxes. People remember back to, I believe it was Walker, California, uh, where there is history of seeing a C-130 with its wings fold. That was oh. an A model aircraft. A lot of work's gone into that. Uh, and a lot of um, a lot of maintenance and, and another reason of replacing the inner outer wing boxes on these aircraft moving forward has uh, really made the difference. But we look forward to uh, the C-130 program expanding. You know, so that puts us at seven C-130s, 23 S-2 Ts. Uh, when it's all said and done, 16 S-70Is. Uh, I will say that there are still 12 UH-1H helicopters uh, that are mothballed. Yeah. until we fully implement uh, the S-70I Firehawk program to be able to better understand what uh, 
you know, we don't want to give up those UH1Hs before uh, we know that the new program is going to be fully uh, supported. And then the OV10s we talked about earlier, I think there might be 17 of them now? 16. 16? Mm-hmm. Uh, and then uh, we have two in-service um, King Airs, uh, a Baron. Um, one of those King Airs uh, has Intel sensor packages on it. And then uh, I talked about the uh, OV-10s that came into AMU here not too long ago, but they are either acquiring or have just acquired a third King Air to be able to use as an air tactical trainer. Uh, to be able to continue to move that program forward. Very cool. And so it's great to hear all, you know, whether it's UAS, whether it's training advancements uh, in the aviation program, the C-130 program, there's definitely a bright future uh, for everything that we're doing uh, in the way of aviation operations. So uh, really thank you guys for both kind of talking about uh, what the future holds for us. And we look forward to seeing all of those things come to fruition. Chief Tyler, we we know that you definitely uh, spent some time in your career uh, in you know overseeing the aviation management program. So, uh, would would you mind just touching on some of the things that you accomplished uh, during your time there, and uh, you know, kind of how that how that has shaped you uh, as the now director and fire chief of of Cal Fire? When you reflect back on some of those great times for yourself. You know, it has been uh, an amazing time over the last several years, and I talk, uh, talked earlier about uh, the Blue Ribbon Commission report really being the start of the transition of uh, our aviation fleet in 2014, being the first budget change proposal to start allocating funds to the first uh, potential helicopter uh, replacement, ultimately getting us into 12 and then 16 uh, Firehawk S-70Is, uh, being able to add to the fleet OV-10s and uh, the C-130s and being able to transition um, over to uh, the C-130s uh, and pulling back in those S-2s uh, for extending their life cycle. You know, I'd like to say that I had something to do with uh, the drone program, but I'm actually going to give it to Chief Sholin, who mm-hmm. really uh, launched it off the ground. It was a lot of talk. Yeah. Um, and a lot of uh, discussions at the table, but no real action until Chief Shulman took it uh, and started expanding that program to where it is today. I guess where I'm going to end this is uh, it's not about me. It's about uh, the team. It's about uh, Chief Payne, Chief Brown, Chief Buno, uh, the administrative staff that have supported it. It's about uh, the aviation officer twos and threes. It's about Uh, the tactical air operations programs uh, that have continued to expand at the battalion chief, assistant chief, deputy chief, staff chief levels. Um, It it takes a group effort to be able to get to where we are. And so while uh, while at some point I will end my career with happiness of uh, seeing us transition into um, a rotary wing aircraft program that will probably last longer than my life cycle uh, moving <laughs> forward. I think we'll still see those flying when, uh, when my day comes. Uh, but um, a C-130 program as well and other programs that, uh, that you know, when, when I have uh, moved to the next chapter of my life, I'll be able to look in the sky and know that I was just a, a piece of that pie that uh, helped create that. And, uh, and it gives me a lot of um, a lot to be proud of and probably one of the reasons I'm still sticking around uh, as long as I have to watch the C-130 program come to fruition. Um, so it's so important to acknowledge that it, it's just not me. It is uh, me just facilitating a great group of individuals who got us to where we are today. That makes a lot of sense, Chief. And again, have to definitely acknowledge your leadership in that effort. Uh, you know, there are a lot of things that have happened uh, during your time. And so you're right. There's a lot of folks who are part of that uh, puzzle. I mean, you know, Chief Sholin's here now and he's doing a lot of stuff uh, in his tenure. And he also um, has a lot to be proud of. But uh, your guys' leadership is what I think we, we really need to celebrate as well uh, as the individuals who are doing some of the other work to, to make this stuff happen. So uh, once again, thanks to both of you for, for keeping this uh, program uh, so well maintained and, and, and operational. It's good stuff. Yeah, l- let me uh, let me let me add just one other piece, and um, you know I don't want to end on a somber note, but 
You know, where we are today is because of the lessons that we've learned and the advancements that are available to us. And so whether it is, um, you know, the loss of uh, Eva Shiky on Copter 404 that has um, created some of our training programs, whether it is our mid-air collision over Hopland and Ukiah uh, that we had then, whether it is the loss of, um, of I believe it was AirTac 410 uh, over Mountain Home in that area, uh, Craig Hunt um, in, uh, just outside of Yosemite, El Portal. Uh, and then, you know, unfortunately, um, the uh, loss of uh, our employees, uh, Josh Bischoff, uh, Tim Rodriguez, and our contract pilot, Tony Sosa, uh, here just this last year. Uh, we take pride in what we do. Uh, we take pride in our aircraft. We take pride in our aircraft maintenance. We take pride in our training programs. And I would have to say in the world we are top-notch, uh, and it takes uh, all of the personnel that are in those programs to make it what we are. And on, on occasion we have uh, we have a tragic loss, um, and uh, we can't let them pass in vain. Absolutely. And uh, we will learn uh, from those accidents and continue to move on. Yes. Thank you, Chief Tyler, for those wonderful words. Really appreciate that. And I'm sure everybody out there, uh, all of the folks who are going to be watching this podcast, uh, will definitely keep all of those individuals uh, in their thoughts as we continue to advance and move forward. Uh, and uh, our thoughts and prayers go out to all of those families. Uh, we will always be supportive of you and uh, thank you for your commitment to this department um, as we move forward. Absolutely. Thank you. So, folks, let me just say that we have made it through yet another podcast, the Five Points Podcast. Uh, this is Monty Manson. We were here with the Chief, uh, Chief Tyler, and also Assistant Deputy Director Jake Sholin. Thank you so much uh, for your uh, time here. Again, this has been a great session. Uh, we look forward to seeing you all next time uh, with yet another podcast. For now, we are going to consider this podcast cooked.